Hey, good morning. Happy Mother's Day. You guys get power. First service didn't get any, so hey, amazing. We are glad you guys are here today. Why don't you stand up with us? Today, we are going to worship a living God.
sign of surrender and worship to him. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray them together. They say this mountain can be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no way through. We've heard the tide will never change. They haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name. So much power in your name. Move the immovable, break the unbreakable. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. Yes, we do. We know that hope is never lost. There is still, there is still an empty grave. God, we believe no matter what. There is power in your name. So much power in your name. Move the immovable, break the unbreakable. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a way of miracle. God, we believe for it. You are the way when there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. You are the way when there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. You are the way when there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. Move the immovable, break the unbreakable. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe for it. Move the immovable, break the unbreakable. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. If you believe that this morning, I want you to sing this with me, okay? Because he said it.
Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus.
music in the church. Mighty, powerful, God creator of the universe. We thank you for your presence right now. And we speak the name, the only name that can break chains. The only name that can heal. The only name that can set people in bondage free. And I ask right now that you move, continue to move in our hearts. Let open up our hearts and our minds to whatever you got to say to us. I pray you receive this time of worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm over here crying. I don't cry. I don't do this. I don't do this. I don't cry. Oh, welcome. Good morning. Welcome to Church 419. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out here. That's mine. I got it. That's mine. And so, if you didn't come in with somebody, go, turn to somebody you didn't come in with and say, good morning, I'm glad that you're at church today. Worship was fun. It is hot in that box. Uh, listen, listen, listen. First and foremost, if this is your first time here, y'all, can we give it up for our first time guests? Woo! We are so glad y'all are here today. My name's Christian. I'm Austin. And we just got a few announcements for you this morning. Well, first of all, happy Mother's Day to Woo! all the mothers out there. And we are so excited that y'all chose 419 to, to come to church this morning. We are so glad to have you. So a couple things, all you ladies, we got some very special gifts for all of you. It doesn't matter if Woo. you're a mother or not. These are um, handmade. There's some um, chapstick and this little square thing, whatever that is, is soap. in there. Soap. soap. There's soap in there. It's handmade, but it's for all the ladies out there. And one more great big announcement that everybody really, really, really needs to remember. The 26th, starting the 26th, we yes. are moving our service times up 30 minutes. So it'll be at 9 and 10.30. So don't be late to church. Yeah, you, you show up later, just hang out in the lobby till second service if you're coming to the first. All right, y'all, listen, May 25th, one thing that we do here and I think is amazing that, that you guys help us do and partner with us financially, but also during things like this, the 25th, we are going to the family kitchen. So this is really fun. We just set up a bunch of food, people come through and eat, and it's really cool to sit down with them, have conversations. Uh, the willingness that they're just open, like, yeah, pray for me. And they'll just open up their lives. It's a really cool time to do hands-on ministry the way that we're supposed to be doing it. So go to church419.com slash sign up, get signed up. It'll be a fun time. You definitely won't regret it. Give up some time of your Saturday and let's go love on our community. Lastly, anybody know what this is? Do y'all know that song like Baby Bottle Pops? Do y'all remember that? Well, we got Baby Bottle Bottles. Baby bottle money holders. Money holders. All right. So we have some of these out in the lobby. Uh, Hope Unlimited is doing something they do every year. It's pretty cool. You take one of these home and you fill it up with all your loose change and you bring it back by Father's Day. And if y'all don't know about Hope Unlimited, y'all should check it out. It's a great organization that helps uh, new families, helps mothers. It's really cool. Sound good? Y'all ready to have some church? All right, y'all. Let's give it up for Pastor Mark. Woo! What's up, guys? Good morning. So I'm going to admit to you, I'm a little thrown off. Uh, if you weren't here, first service, everything shut down, and I got to preach with two lights in my face and a microphone because everything else was off. It was an interesting, it was like ghost stories with Pastor Mark. It was interesting. <laughs> um, but what it reminded me of something is it's not about my words, it's God's word, and I still preach the gospel. Um, 
but it did convict me a little bit. Like sometimes it's more about, did I perform well? And I, I, that's just garbage. And so I want to make sure I submit and surrender to God from the very beginning, like I always do, that he's going to speak to y'all, even though I'm a little bit thrown off. I'm glad that you guys are here. Happy Mother's Day. Um, we want to welcome all the guests in the room. There's always guests that come for Mother's Day. We're glad you guys are here. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. My name is Mark, and I get to serve here with a, a great staff and team. Before we jump in, so what we're going to be looking at today, I want to just um, let y'all know your giving, I've said a few weeks ago, makes a difference around the world. Um, this past week, we were able to go in Elmwood Court. It was a blessing in our community, but you also, your giving makes an impact here just right in this church. Since the beginning of the year, we've baptized right about 25 people just in our baptismal year. That's awesome. And y'all might be like, how does our giving allow that to happen? Well, it allows us to do church on Sunday. It allows us to have great kids ministry. It allows all the things that take place here to happen so that people can hear the message of Jesus and their life can be changed because of his word, not anything we do. We just get to facilitate that through y'all's generosity. And here's what I believe. I believe God is being generous with people that need to meet and follow him and bringing them to this place because we're doing our very best to be generous in every single way. So as we're generous, as we give our very best, it's out of response because God has already gave us his. So you can always give, be a part of what we're doing here. Um, and the giving envelope in front of you has all the different ways that you can give. But today we're continuing our series called Heartbreak and Hope. And we've been in the book of Ruth is what we've been in. And we're trying to understand God's character. And we're learning about God's character by studying this family that's going through transition, this man that's in a field. All of this is helping us learn about God and learning some things about God. We're learning God is always good. God always has a plan. God always has a purpose. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we don't see the fulfillment of it. But we have to believe it, that God is always good. He always has a plan. He always has a purpose. And so since you maybe you haven't been here for a while, uh, let me just catch you up real, real quick. So we've got Ruth and Naomi. They're these two widows. They've moved back to Bethlehem. Their heart is broken. Um, they're hungry. They're hopeless. That's chapter one. Chapter two, Ruth decides I need to go find some food for my mother-in-law, Naomi. She goes out to work in a field. She's just going to pick up scraps to hopefully get enough grain to be able to feed her mother-in-law. She bumps into a man, just so happens. We learned it that week that God doesn't have... God uses just so happens for his purpose. It just so happens she runs into a, a guy named Boaz. And Boaz is one of their family members. And she brings back enough grain in one day to feed her and Naomi for a month. Because Boaz decides to be extra generous. He sees Ruth and he has, he has compassion and favor on her. He sees her hard work. He sees her faithfulness. He sees her kindness to Naomi. And he decides in response to be generous. And that's where we kind of left off last week. And today, we're going to be looking primarily at Ruth chapter 3. And Ruth chapter 3 is kind of the turning point of the story. And Ruth chapter 3 also has some of the most eyebrow-raising verses in this entire book. Um, it's got some interesting things that we're going to read about in here. And in all honesty, today is Mother's Day. And I knew this chapter was going to be preached on Mother's Day. I'm like, this is not really a Mother's Day type of a message. And you're going to see, and I'm like, how am I going to, how does this fit in? But here's what I believe. All of Scripture is useful for us. All of Scripture can speak to us and can teach us about God's character and who we can become when we trust in Him. So we're going to pray, and I'm going to pray that God shows you something in our time today and that it draws you closer to Him in some way. So let me just pray as we start, and then we'll jump in. God, we just submit, we surrender everything that we have to you. This day, this moment as we go to Scripture, God, I pray that you would convict, move, that you would compel us closer to your love. God, we surrender to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. So real quick, we're going to pick up where we left off, and that's chapter 2. We're just going to finish this spot here in chapter 2, verse 22. It says this, says Naomi, so that she's getting home. She's carried all this grain that she has. She comes back. Naomi said to her mother-in-law, I'm sorry, Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, so Naomi has seen, she's got all this grain, and she begins to speak to Ruth. It's good for you, my daughter, to be with the women and work for him, talking about Boaz. So stay in Boaz's field. 
Because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. So she stays there for multiple weeks gathering grain. And she lived with her mother-in-law. So every day throughout the harvest season, she's working. And then it ends with this sentence. She lived with her mother-in-law. Like that is so anticlimactic of the chapter there. That is not something that's like, okay, if somebody comes to you today and says, guess what? I'm living with my mother-in-law. That's not usually a big moment of hope in their life. Not to be, I'm not picking on any moms out there. We love you, mother-in-laws. That's just not what most people prefer to do, okay? I, lo- I love my mother-in-law too. But what we're going to see is this mother-in-law is about to give some advice. She's about to give her a plan. She's about to give her some motherly advice. And a lot of times moms give the best advice. Um, and I, I went this week just looking for some pieces of motherly advice. I knew it was Mother's Day. So in honor of Mother's Day and honor of Naomi's interesting advice that we're about to, to see, I, I saw a YouTube video, and I'm not going to show you the video. I'm going to read some of the advice that the mothers gave. And you can decide if you think this is good advice or not. I think most of these are pretty good. Some of them I didn't understand. I had to ask Melanie, and she explained it to me. But here we go. First one is this. Marry someone who can cook. Looks fade, hunger doesn't. Amen, somebody said. This one I agree with 100%. Always have an escape plan, especially when visiting relatives. You need an out. Yeah, I got I to gotta go. This one I didn't get, but Melanie said it's right. Never buy a piece of clothing without pockets. So somebody like, that's so true. All, guys always have pockets, so I didn't really get that one. But this one I've experienced... If your kids hand you something brown and sticky, don't assume it's chocolate. (laughs) Yep, I've had that happen. Always borrow money from a pessimist. They won't expect it back. (laughs) Some of these teenagers, you want to know when you're an adult? When you get excited about new furniture, when you're spending money on stuff that doesn't move, you know you're probably an adult. Number seven. Before you marry a person, you should first make them use a computer with slow internet to see who they really are. (laughs) Come on, put me with my Wi-Fi is down and you're going to see the real person come out. And then the last one is from Naomi, but honestly, some of you may have heard this too. You need a man. Ooh, you're like, I don't, uh, what are you talking about? Like, this is the advice Naomi's about to give Ruth. And it may not be super politically correct in this day and age, but this is where we start in chapter 3. This is where we're going to begin to talk through today. And the reason today I've decided I'm just going to posture myself a little bit different. I'm going to take a seat because I want us to look at this more like a story than anything else. A lot of times we approach scripture in some different ways, but today I really want to dive into the narrative. I want you to turn on your imagination side of your brain and the movie theater of your brain and really to just picture yourself what it would have been like to be in this story. You know, when it was originally read, it would have been read that way where people leaning in, really attentive, what's going to happen next? And we've sometimes become so familiar with some of these stories, we forget the, just all that went in to them. So I want you to just really think through this story today, and it starts with verse 1. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be provided for. That is Hebrew for you need a man. Okay, you need a husband. And remember, this isn't 2024. This is where being a woman alone in this day and age, especially a foreigner and a widow, that wasn't just going to be tough. That could have been dangerous. And Naomi knew, I'm not going to be alive forever to help and take care. At some point, I'm probably going to be gone, and you're going to need something, someone. So it's a, Naomi's looking out for her. Verse 2, it says, now, now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. So we've been reminded of this a couple different times that Boaz is a relative, and we touched on this real briefly last week. But it's important to understand the significance of this. So I'm going to tell you, turn off your imaginations, turn on your nerdy brain for a second. I'm going to get nerdy Bible teacher just for a quick second because it's important. 
Um, it's important for us to understand this term of guardian redeemer. Others call it kinsman redeemer. And it's really important in this book. It's been spoken of a couple times. And the reason it's important is because he's a relative and he is set up in a perfect position to help their family. So let me put a graphic on the screen to help us to see this. So I don't have to explain every single thing, but here's what a guardian redeemer is. In, in basic terms, it's like super family helper guy. Okay, this is the guy that is set up specifically has some duties and responsibilities. And there's four things throughout scripture. We'll see a person that's got this title that they're supposed to possibly do to help out a family member. One of them is to purchase a family land that's been lost. So land was super important at that time. Um, and if your land had been lost, you'd lost almost everything. So there'd be a family member that could help repurchase the land. Second one is they pay the price to free a family member who had sold themselves into slavery. Third one is to avenge justice on a murdered family member. Let me tell you, none of y'all are the Avengers. You don't need to do this, okay? And the fourth one is a brother marrying his brother's wife if he died. So this makes your sister-in-law real important. I'm helping you pick her out, apparently. Um, but let me explain something really quick. The first three up there go by this Hebrew term goel. And there's an important reason I'm telling you guys this, because in the book of Ruth, every time it talks about guardian redeemer, it uses the term goel. The fourth one there that talks about marriage is not that same term. So I want you to think about this as we move forward. When it's talking about guardian redeemer, it's talking about primary land, not marriage. And it's going to be important as we move on to understand that and to realize the, the significance of that. So turn your imaginations back on. This plan is starting to unfold. So all this, the harvest season has come to an end, and she knows Boaz is going to be out there winnowing grain. So he was on the, a lot of times happened on the a hillside where wind would be blowing, and they would take their pitchforks and they'd throw up the harvest, and the chaff would blow and the grain would fall, and they were separating. And this was towards the end. So there's a time also of celebration, and they're gathering their, their harvest all together in one place, and I'm sure Boaz is with his workers. They're celebrating. And this is the space where Naomi is beginning to unfold her plan for her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Because the harvest season is coming to an end. Ruth has been probably having little bumps and in interactions with Boaz for weeks and weeks as she's been working in the fields, gleaning. But now these little interactions, these little bumps are going to be coming to an end because harvest season is coming to an end. And Naomi knows, um, we got to move now because the little moments are drawing to a close. And so she sets in motion this plan. Verse three, she tells her, wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he's lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. If you are hearing this in the original context, you are blushing right now. Because this is provocative language. And you're like, what in the world is going on? If you're a family member who has brought, you know, family to synagogue, temple today, and they're beginning to read from the scroll of Ruth, you're like, what did I bring my kids to today? You ever been to a movie and you're like, what movie is this? Cover your eyes. That's what's happening here. That's the mindset and the language that is taking place in this passage. And if you're hearing this, you're like, what, what's going on? Especially, you know, some of the, the, the things that you're, you're, you're saying here don't make a whole lot of sense for good advice, but there's three basic pieces of advice. She tells her how to look. She tells her where to go. She tells her what to do. If you've got a mama, I'm sure your mama at some point has asked you, where are you going? What are you doing? What are you wearing? My mama asked that to me a lot. Where are you going? What are you going to be doing where you're going? She didn't usually care what I wore because I didn't like dress dumb. But, you know, every person's had a mama ask them those three questions. And she's giving some advice. And the first one, she gives Ruth a bit of a makeover plan. She tells her to wash up. She does her dab on some perfume and to change her clothes. And many believe this isn't like, hey, look pretty for him. It's you're moving into a new season. Remember, Ruth was a widow. 
She had lost her husband. And a lot of times widow, widows would stay in widow garments, drab, you know, nothing flaunty, just a time of sorrow. And they would stay in those garments. And she was saying, it's time to take that off, to shed that part of you because I believe it's time to move into a new season. I don't think she was trying to get her dolled up and pretty to get Boaz's attention because this is all about to happen in the dark of night. Boaz wouldn't be able to see her. He may not be able to smell her. And she did say put on perfume because let me tell you, ladies and guys, nobody wants someone that smells like they've been cutting onions all day, right? Come on, somebody. So smell good. But really what she's saying is move to a new season. It's not just look pretty. It's move to a new season. And then she says, watch where he's settled. Watch where he lays down. She understands. This isn't about watch till he gets drunk. That's not what's happening here. She's a, Naomi understands that a well-fed person is going to be a happier person, whether it's a man or a woman. And she says, wait till he ain't hungry no more. Then he's going to be more happy. How many of you guys agree with that? So wait till he's happy. Wait till he's laid down. And then she goes and, and lay down and uncover his feet. What are you telling me to do? What are you telling me to do? And then she says this. He will tell you what to do. Where are my daughters? Never tell your daughters, go find a guy and then just do whatever he tells you to do. No! I would never, but this is the, the, this is the advice. And here's what you have to understand. Naomi's got the best of intentions. I think she's actually giving her some pretty decent advice, but not every piece of scripture is prescriptive. Most, a lot of it is descriptive, which means a lot, I've, you know, when we study to preach, we'll go to commentaries, we'll go to studies, I'll watch other people that have preached the same passages to see what are they getting out of this. And I've heard some real messed up versions of what's taught here. And this is not a prescription of how to go get a man, okay? Do not go sneaking up like a ninja into some dude's window going under his covers. This is not a prescription. This is a description. This is not three steps to hooking up with the dude. This is what happened in this instance. And all throughout scripture, it shows how God works even in sometimes our mess. This is what we can see in the character of God, even in this passage. So Naomi's given her this eyebrow raising advice and we're wondering, okay, what is Ruth going to do? And Ruth says, I'll do whatever you say. What? So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. And again, if you're hearing this, you've got to be kidding me. Because these terms, again, we glance right over them, but they have lots of provocative undertones in them. In verse 7, it says, When Boaz had finished eating and drinking, when he was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached him quietly, uncovered his feet, and laid down. Boaz has just finished a successful harvest season. Everything's in the black. The workers are all paid. He's helped the poor. He remembers probably just a few years back when there was a famine, and now he's had a feast and he thinks, man, God has blessed us greatly. We have worked hard. And he lays down next to his grain to protect it, to rest near it. He's probably got some of his workers around. Well-deserved rest. And then this happens. Ruth, in this bold, almost crazy move, quietly uncovers Boaz's feet and lays down. And phrases like this, could have lots of double meanings in Scripture. There's an isolated setting, a man and a woman alone, Ruth uncovering Boaz's feet. It all paints a highly provocative picture, but I, I want to clear some stuff up. Because if you do studies, there's a lot of snickering and whispering. Even today, when you, if, you, if you do a word study on some of these words, you're going to get some interesting things. Now, I've got a, a preaching team. We sit around the table and we kind of dive into some of the scripture. And there's been lots of laughs when we look up the word feet in this passage. Lots of laughs when we look up lie down and snuck in and took over the blanket and all this stuff. But I want to clear some stuff up because you can go to all kinds of assumptions about what took place here. 
There can be all kinds of gossip about, hey, there was a midnight romp in the barley pile, okay? I don't believe that's what's taking place here. And here's why. Let's be clear. The Old Testament doesn't usually hold back on getting pretty explicit on what goes on with some of its characters. It just says it. It'll just say the things that took place. This doesn't say that. I can't 100% know what happens, but it doesn't say that. We also have been introduced to both Boaz and Ruth and seeing their godly character. And I don't think that suddenly has changed. So I believe what's taking place is what's written. And that we can do all these other things, but we're just going to read it for what is written here. But I do believe that the writer has written it with the intent to draw us in, to listen a little bit closer, to say, okay, here's what happened. And yeah, there was a lot that took place here. So we continue. Verse 8, in the middle of the night, something startled the man. Do you think? Yeah, come on. He turned there and there's a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. Now, just step into Boaz's, like, I guess sandals. He maybe didn't have any, but step into that for a second. He's laying there asleep and suddenly he snapped awake. It could have been the, the breeze, you know, suddenly his legs are uncovered. It could have been, how many of you ever know, like you can tell when someone's in your presence when you're sleeping. You can just feel somebody hovering you. If you're a parent, how many of you have ever woken up to a kid staring at you? Like, what are you, you creep weirdo? I've had that happen. Dad, you want to play? No, you look like a zombie right now. What's going on? And just imagine, Ruth isn't sleeping. I'm sure she's just staring, waiting. When is he going to wake up? When is he going to wake up? When is he going to wake up? And finally he wakes up because he can smell something that doesn't smell like stinky man. Who are you? And all he can probably see, because it's, it's not dark like we know dark. It's dark. Possibly he can see the white of her eyes. Who are you? And then Ruth says, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer. There's that word, Goel, of our family. But she's asking for something else. And Ruth has now departed from Naomi's plan. Naomi's plan was sneaking like a ninja. Lay down next to him, uncover his feet, and he'll tell you what to do. She snuck in like a ninja, uncovered his feet. He told her what to do, kind of, because he said, who are you? And then she went rogue. She started saying, here's what I want from you. And when she says, spread your gar garment, spread your covering over me, what she is doing is proposing that he proposes to her. She's saying, you should propose to be my husband. This is very bold. This is going above and beyond even what Boaz would have had the responsibility as the goel of their family to do. And here's why. I think it's Deuteronomy, maybe it's Exodus 25. It talks about the responsibility of a brother that's marrying his brother's widow. And it talks about them being in the same home, the same land, a brother. Boaz is not a brother, first off. Boaz also sees Ruth and who knows how legal her marriage was. She was a foreigner from a forbidden land. But Ruth knows something. What Ruth knows is, I've seen this guy go above and beyond the minimal expectations time and time again. I've seen this guy go above and beyond just letting me glean to him being generous and pouring out. I've seen him, and Naomi has seen that happen as well. So even when she was telling her to move on, she knew what she was doing. And Ruth went beyond asking just for land. She asked for her future to be secure, for there to be a, a marriage that took place. This is a stepping out big time. This was a brilliant twist, and it leaves us like, how is Boaz going to respond? And Boaz says, the Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You've not run to younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I'll do for you all you ask. All the people of the town will know you're a woman of noble character. Boaz might have been stunned, but his response was once again gracious, was once again kind. And he didn't respond, man, 
He didn't just think your kindness is because you didn't go after a younger guy. What he once again saw was the kindness that she was sticking her neck out on the line for Naomi. She was sticking her neck out on the line once again at the risk of harm. She risks embarrassment. One of the things that she's risking, because she's, she's inviting him to say, hey, I want you to marry me, but that also means she's risking that I'm going to open myself up again to try to have children. She doesn't have any kids, which all, for all she knew, she was barren. She's opening up that risk to have, feel that pain again. She's doing this all because she's got a mother-in-law that she loves. She's been instructed to care. And Boaz sees all of this as kindness. He sees all of this as goodness. He sees, he sees all of this in her. And he responds. And what we can hear is like, we can hear the wedding bells in the distance. Everything's going the way that we think it should go. And then verse 12. He says, although it's true that I am a guardian redeemer, there is another who is more closely related than I. Ah, boom, boom, boom. There's another guy in the picture. How many of you guys have ever had another guy in the picture? You're like, I gotta shake this guy off of me. There's another guy in this picture. And he says, stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as a guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he's not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. This is another reason why I don't think anything scandalous happened here because Boaz could have once again taken advantage of a situation, but he knew, here's the law. This person's closer than I am to redeem you, and I'm going to just follow God's plan. I'll go approach him, ask if he wants to do this, and then we'll move forward. Boaz once again shows character. So it says, she laid at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you're wearing, hold it out. When she did, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then she went back to town. He went back to town, sorry. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? And if you read that in the original, she basically says, who are you? She knows who she is. She's asking, who do you belong to? Who did, did he propose? And I want to think, like Naomi's been back at home. She sent her out on this mission. And I'm sure she's been pacing the floor, waiting for her to come back, peering out the window. There's no text. There's no live updates. She's wondering what's going on. And then here she comes back home. Naomi is back. And then Ruth speaks. Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her. And added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. There's a significance there because when chapter one, Naomi says, I don't have anything, I'm bitter, I'm just empty. And now we see God beginning to say, you're not empty, I've given you. It's through Boaz, but there's a blessing that's coming. And then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. So one way or another, Things are going to be settled. A redemption is going to take place. Ruth returns from Boaz with not just grain, but a promise. This is going to be settled. Things are going to be taken care of. And the chapter ends and we're just left waiting. What's going to happen next? And Boaz seemingly has taken center stage. What's going to happen next? But the reality is God is still in control. God is still moving. God has still got the pieces orchestrating. He is still behind the scenes, showing that I'm always good, I've always got a plan, I've always got a purpose. He does it through us. It's a great story. But here's what I want us to see today, because it's, it's important for us to, to see these stories, but what can I learn about the character of God in this story? How can I draw closer to Him through this story? What's kind of the point that I can take home? So there's something I want to direct our attention to. From Ruth chapter 3, Boaz says this word, kindness. He says, you know, it's a reoccurring word. It's in chapter one, it's in chapter two. And the word actually, usually we don't go a lot of Greek or Hebrew because sometimes that can get a little boring, but it's important for us to understand this word, hesed, H-E-S-E-D. This is an important word all throughout the Old Testament. Here in the book of Ruth, it's translated as kindness. In other places in the Old Testament, you'll see it translated as 
loving kindness or loving mercy. And the thing is, we don't have a word in English that actually directly correlates to this word. Because it doesn't just mean kindness. I want you to think like compassion, love, mercy, all of this wrapped into one word that can only come from God. And so when it says kindness here, it's saying there's this love that can only come from some other source that you're showing. Has said. So it's not just you're kind. It's, man, you're being a reflection of the goodness and the, all the character of God is showing in your life. And so when I read that, and I see the said of these different parts of this story, Ruth sticking her neck out on the line, t- making bold choices and decisions out of a reflection of God. We see Boaz being extra generous, said showing up. And it leads me to ask a question of you, a question of myself. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, am I a reflection of God's loving kindness to the people in my life? Are you a reflection of Hesed to the people in your life? And I wanted us to pause and really imagine this story and, and put ourselves in. Like, what would it look like to be living at this time, to be a part of this story? But here's the truth. This little love story here is part of a way bigger love story. It's just a little piece that's actually a, a really important piece that's leading to a bigger love story, and that's Jesus' love for us. And we don't have to just say, man, this is a cool story. What would it have been like to be in this? We can say, I can be in this story. We don't have to imagine being in the story. We can actually live in the story. We can show the said, the loving kindness of God to other people. Paul writes kind of what this type of love looks like. In 1 Corinthians 13, it's a passage that many of us are familiar with from weddings. But this is not a wedding passage. This is a follower of Jesus passage. And it talks about the love of God. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of right and wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Here's the truth. God is love. So that means all those things in there where it says love, you could replace with God. God is love, which means God is patient. God is kind. God, God at the end of the day, never fails. And what we're called to do is reflect that to other people, to reflect that goodness, that type of love to the people around us. The reason that we see this story of Ruth and Boaz is because they just are constantly reflecting a lot of different pieces of the character of God. And we're drawn to it because the gospel always is compelling and draws us closer to it. And here's what that type of love does, guys. If we show the said loving kindness of God to others, it breaks down barriers. It opens people up. We went and hung out at Elmwood Court on Thursday and just past little Mother's Day gifts to all the kids and teenagers. And there's a couple moms that came up and they're like, I never get anything for Mother's Day. It was just us doing a little moment there to try to, has said, loving kindness, right. nothing in return. Because one of the things has said also means is unmerited mercy, which means I'm getting mercy that I don't deserve. That's what God has given to us. Are we showing that type of love and mercy to other people? Because when we do, it changes the temperature. When we do, it changes the church, changes our community, but we have to actually walk it out, not just learn about it. That's why this story is so important, because we see people walking out the said. We see people walking out this loving kindness. And when we walk out this kind of love, we're not just reading the story, we become part of the story. And I want us to become part of the story, not just to read it. Not just to read it, but to actually become part of it. To really understand and believe God is good. God does have a plan. God does have a purpose. And that God is love. And at the end of the day, God never fails because love never fails. And you might be like, how do you know that? Let me remind you, Jesus. 
God is patient, Jesus. God is kind, Jesus. God never fails, it's Jesus. We are sinners, and all we deserve is the wrath of God, honestly. But we have a guardian redeemer that's way better than Boaz, that covers us, covers our sin, died on the cross so that we could be forgiven and set free. But if that's where it ended, that would be a love that failed. But love never fails. So the cross was just one moment that led to us being reconciled, but he rose from the dead. He lives. He's alive. Love never fails. Guess what? We need to start living like it. We need to start living like we actually believe that God doesn't fail. And if God doesn't fail, I'm not going to fail because God lives inside of me. We got to start living like it. And you guys have done an amazing job. Otherwise, we wouldn't have baptized a bunch of people and been able to give and bless our community. Love never fails. And he's given his church as his body to be a force in our communities and our neighborhoods to show that this is what love in action looks like. This is the good news. We sang this song this morning and I said, Alex, it's a new one and people are going to take a while to catch on to new songs. But the words are so simple. This is the good news. If you're living, it's for you. Stand up with us. An empty grave. A life that's changed. It's Jesus' name. This is the good news. If you're breathing, it's for you. An empty grave. A life that's changed. It all points to Jesus' name. If you've been searching and nothing's been worth. today that needs just to understand that they have hope, that they, they are loved, they are forgiven. God, maybe they've never surrendered their life to Jesus. Today is the day, the day to submit and say, you are the Lord. I'm repenting and turning from you. God, for others who maybe are in a, a time of waiting like this chapter ends with just two ladies waiting. God, I pray that even in the middle of waiting that we would continue to trust, we would continue to love we continue to walk out to that kindness. God, we thank you for who you are, that we can trust you every step of the way. God, this is good news. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, get a picture with your mom if your mom's here today. Ladies, all of you don't leave without getting that little gift. Never forget, God loves you. God has a plan for you. God is bigger than any need. You did church here. Go be the church out there.